Thanks everyone for coming. This is our first webinar of our new webinar series and um, this one is going to be on understanding anxiety. So I'm Megan, this is Ellen, we're mental health practitioners from the St Helens Mental Health Support Team um, but lots of you are joining us from different boroughs today. So we're going to have a little chat today about anxiety. So first of all we're going to have an introduction to ourselves. So some of you might be very well aware of what we do, others not, and um, you might have accessed us before. Then we're going to have a little chat about what anxiety is and have an overview of that. Then we're going to look at some strategies and techniques to support young people who present as anxious and then going on to some signposting and resources. So as you can tell, and as I said at the start, if you were here at the beginning, we've not got any microphones on or cameras from anybody else and the chat function will not work. This is just simply for security reasons. Um, we, if you do have an emergency concern, the crisis number is here on the screen and the reach tech service as well. If you have any other questions or concerns, it's not an emergency, please just get in contact with your mental health lead and they'll be happy to pass on any questions or you could pop an email to the email that sent you out this link as well and we'll get back to you as soon as possible. So first of all, then we're just going to have a little intro to MHST. So as Megan mentioned, some of you might be aware of what we do, uh, but if not, we'll just do a short little overview of who we are as a service. Um, so we are part of the mental health support team and we cover all four boroughs. So we cover Halton, Warrington, St Helens and Knowsley. Um, and we are, uh, are an early intervention mental health services working in schools. Um, so we are quite quite a new service. Um, so not a lot of people know about us, but uh, so far the feedback we've received is, is really positive. Um, but our aim really is to support young people to learn strategies and new ways to take care of their mental wellbeing. Uh, we work on a CBT based uh, uh, interventions so the, the interventions we'll go into on the next slide but we do provide uh, low level mental health support for mild to moderate mental health difficulties um, but we also do a lot of whole school approach things as well so we deliver talks like these and work very closely with schools to promote mental well-being and a positive ethos to mental well-being within schools as well. Um, so just very briefly, our interventions that we do offer on a one-to-one -one basis, uh, we do uh, behavioural activation for low mood. Uh, this is primarily with um, children in high schools, but we do we can tailor it for sort of year five and six as well. Um, but this is so, sort of supporting young people to engage in activities when their motivation is low and when they're presenting with low mood. Uh, we offer worry management, which is where, where we teach children strategies to manage their worries and to help problem solve, problem solve any worries that they've got uh, and this is what today's webinar will be focused on as well um, we do also work closely with parents so for children aged eight and below we do do one-to-one -one sessions with parents which is essentially giving parents the skills to be the therapist um, just because that way the, the progress happens a lot quicker um, and you see a child you know every day uh, whereas we have an hour a week with a child and they might not retain that if that you know if they are eight and, and below so it's a really really positive intervention to work with with, with your child that you can sort of teach them those skills yourself um and we also do parent-led behavior management as well so parent-led for anxiety and parent-led for behavior management too and um, we do graded exposure which is focusing on a specific worry or a specific anxiety that a child might have uh, we do step-by-step -step approaches to help them to overcome their fear um, and sort of breaking it down into more manageable manageable steps for them um, and we do a lot of whole school approach things like I mentioned before so we address mental well-being across the whole school um, we can do mental health audits to help the school identify any areas of concern or any areas that they can sort of uh, support you know their pupils with we do whole class workshops assemblies staff training we do parent workshops as well and webinars like this so uh, just promoting that sort of um, message of you know mental well-being and what and giving schools a strategy to support their pupils and families as well with the mental health. Um, so just an overview then of anxiety. So anxiety is really, really prevalent in young people in Britain. So almost 300,000 young people have a known anxiety disorder, but this is estimated to actually be probably about 5 to 19 percent of all uh, children and adolescents, so a lot higher um, in the UK. Uh, I think this is over time as well becoming a lot more prevalent as more kind of education is around mental health and people are more aware of their mental health and taking care of themselves I think we probably will see an increase in this as well 
Um, in a study, it was found that 11 to 16 year olds with poor mental health were actually over 60% less likely to feel safe in school and also less likely to report they were enjoying their learning and having friends to turn to. So anxiety can have a massive impact on children and young people. So if you are a young person who is experiencing this, you're definitely not alone. It affects so many people and it can really be debilitating. It can really affect your day to day life as well. So the ICD, which is the International Classification of Diseases 11, um, defines anxiety as apprehensiveness or anticipation of future danger or misfortune accompanied by a feeling of worry, distress or somatic symptoms of tension. The focus of anticipated danger may be internal or external. Now, this is a bit of a long winded way to say that anxiety is essentially a fear of something that might happen or might not happen. So it can be a worry about, you know, what if I fail a test or a worry about what if my friends don't like me? It's that anticipated danger. Um, and it's that feeling that you can get in your body too that can, can kind of bring around those, those physical feelings of worry as well. Um, so anxiety might look like for a child or young person, um, it might be constantly worrying or having negative thoughts. So like I said, having those what if worries, you know, am I going to fail this test? Um, what if my teacher um, doesn't like me? All these different things that they can have. Or am I going to get the answer wrong if I put my hand up? Constantly having those thoughts and putting themselves down too. So thinking that they're not good enough or thinking that they're not very good at something when they might be. Um, so having those, those constant worries and negative thoughts. Obviously, when you have all these worries, it can be really, really hard to concentrate. So it can really affect learning. Um, it can affect, you know, sitting in an exam for a long period of time. Uh, it can really have a massive impact on concentration. Um, again, due to these worries kind of buzzing around their heads, it can lead to them having sleeping problems. So not being able to sleep, not being able to fall asleep on a night time, or also waking up in the middle of the night and having bad dreams or needing to go to the bathroom or whatever it might be. But constantly having that disturbed sleep as well can be another um, kind of symptom of anxiety, if you like. Not eating properly as well can be a massive one. So this can go either way, really. So you can either not eat a lot at all. You could eat maybe too much sometimes. It can go either way. I know myself, I, I definitely use food as a coping strategy sometimes. So completely understand it, but it, it can go either way depending on the person. Um, quickly getting angry or irritable. So you might notice in yourself or in the young person that you're taking care of that they are snappy maybe with you. They may be back chatting a little bit more often. And this all comes from that anxiety feeling. It's not that they're being malicious. It's just that they've got such a short fuse at the moment that any little thing sometimes, especially you can imagine lots of thoughts going around your head and then somebody asks you a question, it just adds more to that. So definitely not intentional to be angry or irritable, but that absolutely can come up as well. They can also feel really tense and some fidgety and use the toilet often so they can be constantly going to the bathroom in school asking for a, a timeout pass or they can be shaking their leg or clicking a pen or if they've got a fidget toy in class they could be using that quite often all of these are completely normal completely common um again you might have one of these you might have none it might look completely different for you that's completely fine anxiety affects people in completely different ways but these are kind of the main things that we tend to see in young people who are feeling anxious so anxiety kind of comes from this fight, flight and freeze response. Now, some of you might have heard of it before, but it's our body's natural response to danger. Um, so it's been on us since we were cavemen millions and millions of years ago. And although back then we might have had dangers like wild animals and there's none of those around, you know, any of our areas at the moment, um, we do have other responses um, and other dangers that we can perceive as a threat. So even something as simple as a, a child being asked to answer a question in front of everyone in class can trigger that fight, flight and freeze and make them feel like there's a danger. Um, so this is when this is triggered in a non-dangerous situation. So a couple of examples in, on here, but again, not an exhaustive list. So school, definitely a major one for a lot of young people. Even coming into school sometimes for young people can be really, really stressful. Um, answering questions in class, like I said, or break times and lunch times in those social situations can be really, really stressful or crowds. So school can be a massive trigger for this. Uh, friends, so if there's any friendship difficulties or just even wondering if their friends like them can be a massive trigger for some young people too. Uh, family, so any, you know, siblings that they have a little bit of rivalry with or anything at home, 
I think that definitely be a trigger for this response. Uh, exams, as you can understand, being in an exam environment under all that pressure can trigger this fight, flight and freeze. Um, any negative life events, so if they've experienced anything traumatic in their life or they've had a bereavement, that can absolutely bring on this response. Uh, physical health as well, so if they have to go to the hospital for any blood tests or doctor's appointments, um, this, can, this can bring about this feeling. Bullying, obviously, kind of speaks for itself, but feeling threatened by somebody in school, um, stress in general, um, and social media, um, which I know lots and lots of young people are on, um, can really be impacted. And again, bullying can come with that as well. So again, not an exhaustive list. It might be something else that is triggering this response in the young person, but all completely normal. Um, and we see this very, very often as well. So going through this fight, flight and freeze then, in the fight mode, we might see young people doing some of these things on the screen here. So hitting out, throwing, shouting, swearing, hurting themselves or fighting with peers. Now, it's never actually intentional that they want to do this. It's just this. Their bodies are taking over. It's an automatic response. Um, you know, if you say if you're in the wild, you saw a bear you wouldn't stop to think if it was a friendly bear, you would just run or fight it if you could. Um, it's the exact same thing for children in school. So their brains don't have time, um, or with anxiety really, that you don't have time to think about your actions. It just, your body takes over to keep you safe. So lots of young people can have this fight response in them. Um, so again, they don't particularly mean to do any of these things and a lot of the time are very apologetic afterwards, but it's just, again, their brains just take over to keep them safe so they can do these actions. In the flight mode, you might see the young person leaving the classroom without permission. So if it's either going to you know, the bathroom or wherever it might be, or they might just leave and go wandering around the corridors, but they just need to get out of there. That's what their brain is telling them, that they need to leave that dangerous situation. Running around school, you might have to go on a bit of a wild goose chase with them, um, running around school and just trying to find a way to get to escape that situation that they're in. And um, They might feign illness to avoid. So if we're parents at home, we might see that the child might be in the morning, you know, saying they've got a tummy ache or saying they've got a really bad headache or something like that. And they very well might be feeling that because anxiety can bring about those feelings. But it also could mean that they're trying to avoid that situation or say if they had an after school club that they didn't want to go to or something extracurricular. And um, they can they can feign some some illness or, or, or come up with an excuse to try and get out of that situation again, not maliciously, just because they're feeling really worried. Um, they can also escape to a perceived safe place. So like I mentioned before, the bathroom or if the school's got a sensory room or they get on with a particular staff member, you might see them in their office quite a lot of the time. So that's the flight mode. So obviously it can be running away or it can be kind of hiding or feigning that illness as well. Uh, freezing. Uh, so this is the other response that we can have. So they might refuse to answer a question or participate in an activity in class. Um, again, not mean they're not meaning to be malicious. It's just that their brain is just so frozen with all the thoughts that are running around that they can't bring out uh, a word to answer that question or they might not want to participate in that activity. They might not feel up for it. And um, they might hide, so under or behind furniture. And um, they might refuse to come out in the car in the morning if you're taking them in or just refuse point blank to come through the school doors or classroom doors as well. So this is what we'd kind of call the freeze mode. So your brain's not able to process the situation. So you kind of go into a bit of a shutdown. So these are the kind of three options usually um, when you are faced with something that would trigger your anxiety. Now, a kid one day might be in fight mode and the next be in freeze or it can change during the day as well. You could do all three. You might only do one in particular, but all of these completely normal, completely um, common um, with, with people with anxiety and people experiencing that feeling. Your brain just wants to get you out of there, wants to keep you safe. Again, nobody's meaning it in a mean way or trying to, you know, be rude to parents or teachers or whoever it might be. It's just the body's natural response to danger and that perceived danger that they might be feeling. So when someone is anxious, you can feel all of these kind of bodily symptoms. So the classic one really is your heart racing. So the reason it does this is because of that fight, flight and freeze. So your body's preparing you to um, to, to get do some exercise, basically. So either fight your way out or something, run away or kind of hide. So your heart will race to try and pump that blood around your body and um, to be able to get you to get out of that situation or to fight your way out. 
again with your heart pacing it comes sweating as well so that's a very common body sensation getting a headache again if there's lots of thoughts running through your brain it's understandable that eventually you might get a headache and um, we might feel sick and um, again our body's getting us ready for exercise so sometimes it wants to just expel everything and that's where the sick feeling comes in uh, again if you're hot and sweaty too your sickness can come in as well uh, fidgeting so fidgeting shaking their leg whatever it might be so Again, it's the body trying to get rid of that energy. So if you can't run anywhere, you might see that fidgeting because they've got the pumped up energy from the heart racing with anxiety that they need to kind of release. Uh, shaking, again, the exact same thing with fidgeting. Uh, overwhelming thoughts. They might just feel like everything's a bit too much and they can't kind of have one coherent thought. They might just have too much going on in their brain. They just can't think of anything. Uh, tummy ache and um, so they could feel like they've got a tummy pain uh, again this is a very real feeling but it can often come through from anxiety and um, crying and um, one that we can see a little bit more often and obviously finding it hard to breathe as well so some might feel a little bit panicky or that they can't really breathe properly or it's they're breathing a lot shallower or whatever it might be and um, so all of these again not an exhaustive list at all you could have a completely different one and that's completely normal as well and um, we get lots of kids who say they've got their pins and needles or um maybe their throat's really dry and they've got a sore throat so we do get lots of them um but again all completely normal all to do with that fight flight and freeze that every single person has um in their bodies so just talking about some strategies now and some techniques on how to support perfect so i know we've got a mixture of sort of school staff and parents and carers on here but these will help you to sort of support children um that you help take care of um just if they are particularly anxious uh, or for any child if they are worried about a certain situation these are really good strategies um so the main one really is to try to not avoid anxiety provoking situations as this can make our worry worse now we understand why we would not want to avoid things that make us feel anxious because it doesn't feel very nice so for example if i don't like driving on a motorway I'll try and get on the country road so I don't have to drive on the motorway so it makes sense I don't feel anxious I feel comfortable but what happens then every time I go to drive on the motorway that level of anxiety will still be there I'll still make that I'll still have that worry and that worry might actually escalate over time because I'm just putting it off and putting it off and um, it's the same with children with their anxiety now the reason why as parents carers and teachers we might sort of help them to avoid those situations is because we want them to take care of them we want them to be happy we don't want them to be anxious but like I said over time Time, that can actually maintain that worry a little bit as well in a child who's anxious in school for example they could be really anxious about going to gymnastics class after after school so they might avoid that class they might go no I'm not going I'm, I'm, I definitely don't want to go and really get worked up over it so they might not go but what usually happens is when they do go, they enjoy it more than they think they do. And the next time they go, they're equipped with the skills to be able to manage better in that situation. And over time, the anxiety will decrease. Now, there might always be that level of anxiety there. They might always feel a little bit uncomfortable in those situations, but they're able to manage with that anxiety a lot better and usually sort of help prove it to themselves that they can do it and they do enjoy it. So it just helps with that, with that, those anxiety levels as well. Um, I'm sure you can all think of a situation where, where you've done this. I know personally, like for the gym, you you know, you try and avoid going to the gym, like, oh, I don't want to go, I'm too anxious. Um, and the more you think about it, the more you build it up. Um, but then when you go, you're like, oh, actually, that was all right. So it's just, you know, we've all had a situation like that before. And it's the same, really, the same strategies that we use with, with a child who's anxious. Um, we just try and encourage them to sort of do those things that are slightly out of their comfort zone. Um, in small steps, you know, you can break it down into small manageable steps for them. Uh, whether you go with them one week and then the following week, you know, they go with, like, with a friend, for example. So try and push them out of their comfort zone a little bit because that is going to help them to tackle their anxiety and give them the skills to be able to tackle their anxiety as well they'll learn that they can manage and they'll learn that actually I can push myself out of my comfort zone sometimes it does get worse before it gets better so of course we're asking them to do something that that they find uncomfortable and that that provokes their anxiety so naturally they might struggle a lot more at first but over time their level of anxiety will, will decrease um, and going back to the small steps as well so you can build their tolerance up of anxiety by doing those small things outside the comfort zone um, and when they're ready then they can move on to those bigger things. So for example, if they worry about going to birthday parties, um, maybe the small step is that they go to their best friend's birthday party that they know they're, they're comfortable with, with, with the parent there. Maybe the step after that could be that they go to someone maybe that they're not that familiar with, with the parent there building up to the, then go into a birthday party without a parent, for example. So you can build them up in those ways and small steps to help them tackle that anxiety. Um, 
And as well, helping children to understand that not all thoughts are facts and our mind can be unkind at times. Um, so we sort of think of worries as what if worries and here and our worries. So what if worries are things that are in the future, things that haven't happened um, and going back to that anticipation. So when, or what if this happens? You know, what if I fail this test? What if my friends don't like me? What if I get this answer wrong? Um, it hasn't happened. So our thoughts are not always facts, but we do worry. But for a child, that thought can feel like it is a fact it can feel really real and um, but it's helping our children to understand that not all thoughts are facts and we can do this by challenging thoughts as well so you can sort of ask them questions you can say oh well what, what do you think will happen and has it happened before or has that happened yet and um, so there's lots of ways that we can help children to challenge thoughts as well one technique that we use in our sessions with children is called the worry tree and um, you can see that on, on your screen but there's also a worry tree app that you can download as well if a child's got a tablet or on your phone for example and um, there's an app that they can go to um, and what this does is it helps children to sort of sort worries it to here and our worries and what if worries so here and our worries are things that are happening that we can do something about so for example i've fallen out with my friend a what if worry would be what if i thought what if my friend falls out with me next week so you can see the difference between things that have happened and what we anticipate and might or might not happen and um, with this worry tree we start at the top and they think about what they are worried about and then ask can they do anything about it so if the worry is i'm worried my friends are going to fall out with me next week well can we do anything about that right now have they fallen out with you no. So that we'd go down to the no side, which is when we ask children to let the worry go. Now, this sounds really simple, but it's a really, really effective way that children can physically let that worry go. Children are really, really respond well to visual activities when it comes to tackling anxiety. So what we ask children to do is we ask them to write it down on some paper and then scribble it out or write the worry down on some paper and scrunch it up, for example. Um, some children like to make, make their worry into paper airplane and throw it away. Um, write it in down on their phone and cancel that, you know, delete that message, for example. So there's lots of different ways that children can physically let the worry go. And this just signifies and it shows them actually, I can't do anything about this worry. This worry is out of my control. So I'm going to let it go. Um, you can even put a bit of Frozen soundtrack on in the background if you want to, to make it a bit fun for them. Um, and then after that, that worry might still be there a little bit. So we then think about things that you can control. So we can't control if your friends fall out with you next week, but what can you control right now? Well, I can control that. That I'm going to play with my friend you know at lunchtime today or I can control that I'm going to do a breathing exercise or try and do something to distract them or things that they think about things that they that are, are in their control as well um, and then the other side of it is the here and now worry so very often children will, will you know they might come to you with, with lots of here and now worries like I've fallen out with my friend um, I've forgotten my homework I'm stuck on my homework for example when a child feels worried about here and now situations they might get really overwhelmed and they might not know a way to solve that worry at all. They might know how to problem solve, but in that moment, that worry feels so big that they can't sort of get gather their thoughts. Problem solving is a really good way that we can use to help solve here and now worry. So using the same, same method again with the worry tree, you'd ask them, can we do anything about it? So we'll use the same example. I've fallen out with my friend. Can we do anything about it? Yes, we can do something about it. What can we do? So we then make a plan. They think about different solutions that they can use to help solve that problem. So for example, I could apologize. I could go and tell a teacher. Um, I could ask them to play with me at lunchtime or maybe I can play with somebody else. So they can think about different solutions to their problem, thinking about the pros and cons of each solution as well and then picking one to try. It really helps children to have it written down and to talk through those different steps with them so they have that sort of plan going forward on how they can solve that problem. Now you can do this written down or like I said, you can just talk them through it if you want to. You can give them ideas of solutions. And we say to them, try the solution out, make a plan, you know, see how you're gonna how you're gonna carry out that solution. And if the solution doesn't work, you've got three or four more to pick from. So it really helps them to equip them with the skills to manage those here and now worries as well. And I know in, in schools, you know, you get a lot of children with here and now worries, oh, so and so said this Smith was shine where I'm stuck with this. So these are really good strategies to help them problem solve, but it also helps build their resilience as well, helps build their Sort of um, understanding of what they can do with worries um like i said you can get a worry tree app on your phone you can print this out we've got we get children to draw them quite a lot in sessions or create them out of card and things like that so you can make it a really fun activity for them but it just really helps to break down the difference between things that we can control and things that we can't control and they learn then that actually I can't control these what if worries. I can't control what happens in the future. I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm not a magician at all. So it can really help them to see the difference between the two types of worries um, and give them those skills as well.
We also focus a lot on sort of mindfulness and breathing techniques as well um, as a way to sort of redirect attention and as a way to change the child's focus from the anxiety. Um, because when a when the child's anxious, they might focus on the same worry and over, over and over. They might not be able to move on from a worry. These really help to take a child's mind off of worries. Um, so there's loads of different ones on YouTube, but we're just going to talk you through a few today. Um, so a really popular uh, technique that we use for children for, with breathing techniques is called finger breathing um, or take five. Some children might just call it take five. So using your hands, what you do is you use your other hand and you go to the bottom of your thumb. As you go up, you take a deep breath in and pause as you get to the top of your finger and take a deep breath out. And then you repeat that for every finger. So take a deep breath in, pause, breath out, pause, breathe in, pause and out and all the way to the end of your hands and you can do that as many times as they want to it works really well if children are anxious and they're in that fight mode as well or that like i said that flight mode any anxiety really it can really help a child to sort of um relax and, and to feel calm um, and also to gather their thoughts a little bit as well it just gives them that sort of time out so take five is a really really good technique um, and the grounding technique that we like to use with children is the five four three two one uh, you might have heard of this one but this helps to bring a child back to the here and now um the nature of anxiety is that you know that you're anticipating you think about what might happen so you're, you spend a lot of time in the future when you're thinking about anxiety um but actually this helps to focus on the here and now the things that are in our control so we ask children to look around the room and tell me five things that you can see so they might look around the room and see a chair a wall anything around the room four things that you can feel or touch three things that you can hear and for this one they need to listen really really carefully so it really helps with them to focus on the present moment and um, two things you can smell um sometimes they might not be able to smell anything so then we just ask them to think about two things they really like the smell of and imagine that they can smell that um, and one thing you can taste same thing as you know if they can't taste anything think about one thing you really like the taste of and usually they get quite excited to tell you what the favorite chocolate is or what the favorite sweet is um so these are really really simple activities you can make them into a few games as well um but they really work well to help take a child's mind off of anxiety um you can incorporate these into day-to-day -day life so trying to pra practice these skills when you're calm is a really good technique to be able to sort of refer to them when your child is feeling anxious so you know can you do this before bed or can you do it when they come in from school for example just as daily routine and then when they are in a situation that they are feeling anxious they can revert back to them easily then um, and also we do teach children the, the importance of self-care as well so you're never too young for self-care and that's just sort of focusing on those things that they enjoy doing focusing on those things that make them feel good about themselves um, and again you know, incorporating these into day-to-day -day life as well, making sure that we're making time for self-care, whether that's colouring, whether that's spending time with your dog, whether that's baking, whatever it is that your child likes doing, making sure that they're making time for that self-care. On the website that's on the bottom of that screen there, Anna Freud, they've got lots of different, they've got loads of resources on self-care. There's a self-care planner in there as well for parents and for children as well. So, the, you know, really making self-care a priority will help them with the general anxiety and the general feeling of worries because, they, you know, they are sort of doing things that they enjoy and taking care of their mental well-being as well. Sometimes it can be really, really tricky to start a conversation with your child about how they're feeling. Um, children do struggle to talk about their feelings sometimes. They might not know what, you know, what to say. They might not know how to start a conversation. So we're going to sort of go over a few things that you can try um, to help a child talk about their anxiety. Um, so talking to someone, like we said, about how they're feeling can be really hard. Even as adults, you know, it can be quite uncomfortable sometimes talking about feelings. Um especially for children, they might not know how they're feeling, they might not be able to, you know, use the right words to describe how they're feeling um but things that can help is to try and do an activity together to create a relaxed space so can you do it as you're coloring um you know can you do it as you're having a cup of tea if you've got a, you know an, an, old, an older child um that can really help the child to feel more relaxed and that the attention isn't sort of on them so coloring is a really good one so if you're sort of you both sort of coloring and get involved with the activity as well that they might sort of just come out with some worries and talk to you about how they're feeling as well in a more relaxed space and of course that's going to look, look different for every child. So you know what, what what different children find relaxing, for example. So build on that as well and build on what you know helps that child feel calm. If something is wrong, never promise not to tell someone else. This is especially important for anyone working within the school setting. So obviously we've got a duty to safeguard and I know you all do in school as well. So 
they might say, oh, I want to tell you something, but promise not to tell anyone. Never promise not to tell anyone because you might need to pass it on, you know, to keep them safe. But there's ways that you can explain that to your children. You know, I, I can keep it a secret, you know, if it's in, if it means that you're safe. But if I think that you're not safe or someone else not safe, I might have to tell somebody else. So there's ways that you can go about it as well um, and explain it to a child, you know, what kind of situations you might have to tell someone, for example, um, just to make sure that they are safe. Um, and if they don't want to talk right now, that's OK. You know, you might get met with, a, I don't want to talk, leave me alone, or, you know, storming upstairs and things like that. That's OK, too. That might just be them sort of, again, in that fight mode. They might not want to sort of talk about what they're feeling right now. Give them time um, and maybe approach them at a time where you know that they're feeling a bit calmer. You can revisit a situation that they feel anxious in when they are feeling calmer the next day, for example, just to go over, you know, what happened and what made them feel anxious. Um, trying to push a child to talk when they are really, really struggling or if they're in that moment of anxiety can actually sometimes escalate it a little bit more as well. They might, you know, like I said, bring out that fight response in some children too. So some useful conversation starters that you can use with children to sort of dis discuss their anxiety um, is what would you like to talk about? So again, you don't have to go in specifically asking about anxiety. It could just be asking them, is there anything that they want to talk about? Um, not like, oh, what's made you worry today? It could just be, what would you like to talk about? And they might come up with talking about football or talking about some drama that's happened in school, but they might really talk to you about what it is that's bothering them at that moment. Um, is there anything you need from me? Space, time to talk, time to do something fun. Um, so ask them what they would like. And this is so different for every child as well. So some children really like to be close with their family members or friends if they're feeling anxious. Some children really need their own space. So ask them what helps them get to know what your child likes to do or what helps them to feel better if they are feeling anxious. Or if you're in a school, you know, asking individual pupils what helps you when you're feeling like this. Um, that helps the child feel listened to. It helps them to feel understood. Um, and then that trust will naturally build them because, you know, they know that you're taking the time out to listen to them and, and to take, you know, take notice of what helps them um what did you do today that made you proud um again so not necessarily giving that worry and anxiety too much attention so focusing on those things that you know have gone really well today what are you really proud of that helps to build a child's self-esteem it can really help to build their confidence and help them as well to sort of notice those good things in the day and those things that they have been really proud of in that day um it's really good as well if you are working on tackling a certain anxiety like you know taking part in gymnastics whatever it is they can really link that feeling of, you know, oh, I've done this, I feel really proud of myself. So you can really sort of focus on the positives too. Um, asking them again, how can I support you? So asking them, what can I do right now to support you? Um, how are you feeling? Really, really simple ones. Ask them, how, how are you feeling? How are you feeling today? Some children might struggle with this. So we, you can have visual cues, you know, you can print off loads of different um, like emotion faces and things like that. I know um, in classrooms, you, you do usually see a lot of sort of visual things for emotions, but that can be a really good one. You know, can the child point out what photo they feel like today if they do struggle to sort of talk or even can a child write it down you know if they struggle to sort of tell you how they're feeling can they write it down and then and then give it to you for example um and what was the best or worst bit of your day again these things you can incorporate into day-to-day -day life it doesn't, it doesn't have to be just when your child's anxious and um, getting used to doing these sort of daily or you know more often can really help the child to sort of get used to talking about those really good things and maybe those things that they didn't find too easy either so just normalizing it we do say as well, you know, at home or in school, normalise talking about your feelings as well. So normalise talking about things that's made you feel anxious, things that, you know, what you ha what happened to you that day. So oh, I was really stressed this morning because I was in traffic, but what I did is I took a deep breath. So that can help a child to open up about their anxieties as well. Um, it's really, really common as adults, we might not want to show our children that we are upset or that we're anxious, um, but actually it helps to model to them that, oh, we all feel anxious, we all feel worried, but this is what I can do when I do feel anxious you're modeling those coping skills to them even if you make it up you know you can say oh I was really anxious about going to the dentist but when I got home I had a little bit of a treat you know I, I put my feet up and watched tv so you can model to them that you've challenged that brave behavior as well um so really really good conversation starters to help children talk about those big feelings too
Thank you. So the next kind of part we're doing is just about signposting and resources as well for any further information that you need. So for young people uh, in general, obviously school staff are a really good first point of call. Um, lots of schools have pastoral leads, um, even a form tutor in like a high school or a particularly, you know, one of the, your child's particularly favourite teachers, anyone that they want to go and speak to, whoever they're comfortable with, if it's a dinner lady, whoever it is, just getting them to speak to someone in school um, is really, really useful and getting them to know um, people in school as well obviously we are in um, a lot of the schools as well we don't cover just yet 100 percent of all the boroughs and um, but we're hoping to by 2025 but if you do have an mhst in your school definitely come and speak to us and um, get the contact details for your mental health leading school and they can contact us with any questions that you have as well um as well um, as this, we've also got lots of useful websites that young people can use. So uh, Young Minds is a really good one. They've got some great information on anxiety, on low mood, on all these different things that you can have a look on there for, for mental health. Um, and they've got loads of resources um, as well as like support groups and things like that if children want to reach out to those. Those are really useful. And Cooth as well, which is a online um, mental health website, which basically you can speak to. So it's it's for children age um, 10 plus, I think, or maybe 11. Um, but basically you can go in here and talk to a trained practitioner who can support you with um, anything you want to talk about, really. And it's it's you don't have to give your name. You just have to give your age, I think, and like a general location um, to speak to a, to a professional, professional on there. So that's a really good website as well. If you just wanted someone to like vent to or, you know, your young person might want someone to vent to on there um support for parents uh, we have the mental health foundation so that's kind of like your minds but for um for adults instead so that's got loads of amazing resources on there as well if you're struggling uh, or if you're struggling because your child's struggling uh, mind as well another great website to use um Obviously, being we're from St. Helens Borough, we've got Think Wellbeing in St. Helens. Not too sure about Halton and Knowsley uh, and Warrington, but I think you might have a similar service. But this NHS link here, um, nhs.uk slash NHS services, mental health services, um, can find that local um, wellbeing service that you, you would, if you want to access that. Um, again, this is also open for, for school staff too. Uh, Quell is the adult version of Cooth, what I just explained. So basically it's completely free to sign up. You chat to somebody online, train professional, you can vent to them about your day basically, or if you've got any particular worries that you want to work through with them, really, really great um, support on there. Um, really important, obviously, for, for parents and school staff to, to model that self-care, but it's also important to do that self-care yourselves because at the end of the day, you're supporting a child who is feeling worried or is feeling anxious. It can take a lot of toll on you as well. So please, please, please make sure you're taking care of yourself. It's like that, you know, if you're on a plane, you're meant to put the oxygen mask on yourself first rather than the child, because how are you going to help them if you're not able to breathe? It's the exact same thing with mental health. So make sure that you're trying to keep yourself up, um, mentally well as well. And um, reaching out if you do need that support, there's absolutely no shame in it. Lots of people do. It's so, so important to look after yourselves. Um, specifically for school staff, there's this education support partnership that you can be used. Um, it's a 24 hour free confidential helpline for people working specifically in education. So they're there to listen. They're there to chat to you about your day. Um, if you need to have a little vent to somebody or you want to have specific advice, they're a really, really good um, company to use. Um, again, just reiterating that crisis information as well. If you did need urgent support, these are the um, companies that this is sorry, this is the crisis line that we recommend by Mercy care um, and also the reach text service if you prefer to message somebody instead there's lots of crisis signs in there but if you ever feel like you or your child is in danger please don't hesitate to phone 999 and they can make sure that you are staying safe uh, if you do have any questions about anything that we've talked about today or if you would like to get involved with our service or you would like your young person to see us then please ask your mental health lead in school or if you are school staff find out who that is in your school, that link person, and they can pass on our details to you and we can see if we can get that child assessed and, and see if they'll be good for our service and if they would want to work with us. Um, again, we can do, if you've noticed anything here that sounds like your child or a child that you've got in mind, you know, you can let us know if you feel like they'll be um, wanting some extra support and we can go through uh, any of our interventions with them as well. Again, we're not in every school, but we're in quite a majority of them. So please get in contact with us. We also have a website as well that I will send out to everybody. But if you just search like Mersey Care Mental Health Support Teams, it comes up. Got lots more information on there as well as our team's email address. So you can kind of get in contact with us there as well if you've got any questions or anything like that. 
Um, so that is it for today, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. This was kind of our like little pilot for our webinars today. So we hope it's been okay for you. If you could just give us a little bit of feedback, there's a QR code on the screen, which I'll leave up for a couple of minutes. And um, that'd be amazing. And um, we've got another one next month in February. And um, so I think a lot of you have signed up to all of them. So you'll just receive that link again. That's going to be run by Warrington, I believe. So it'll be different practitioners. And um, we're kind of doing it on a bit of a rotation. So if you could leave us some feedback, that'd be absolutely amazing but thank you so much for listening today um, and I hope you all have a lovely weekend so I'll keep this on the screen for another couple of minutes but thank you very much everyone thank you